you can walk downtown and say, well, this building used to be uh, the old First National Bank, or this used to be, you know, I mean, I can walk downtown myself and identify what those buildings were when I was a child. You know, I, I can go down and name you what, what the businesses were up and down the street. You know, I find that Elk River is often a part of these significant journeys through the state and through history. Um, I think you start with the rivers, both the Elk River and, and the Mississippi River, which brought explorers to the area. Uh, and then you move into the wagon trails, which sort of established commerce into the area. Um, the railways ultimately brought industry and then the highways really brought community. So you have all these things that are happening to and through Elk River. And it, it sort of kept it as in a place of prominence um, in both regional and, and state history. It's shaped and changed a lot as time's gone on. And um, it's, it's more resilient, I think, because of that. Elk River is a city on the water, located where climate, geography, and people converge. Molded by history, all who come here leave their mark, but those who stay leave their legacy. I'm Zachary Griffiths, historian, local, and commissioner on Elk River's Heritage Preservation Commission. This program is meant to highlight the little known yet preserved history of our city. While it is not a complete history, nor does it specialize in any one area, it is one way to tell our story. Like most stories, We'll have to start at the beginning, over two million years ago. Millennia of climactic violence scarred the geography and geology of what we now call Minnesota. Up until only 12,000 years ago, the Laurentide Ice Sheet covered the majority of the state. Indeed, it covered the northern half of the continent. As it receded, this mass of ice and rock left the countless lakes and rivers the state would become known for. The Mississippi, Minnesota, St. Croix, Red Lake, Mille Lacs, Superior. Today, nearly 8.5% of the surface of the state is fresh water. Paleo-Indians first entered the region about seven to 9,000 years ago. With average winter temperatures well below freezing and modern expectations of 30 to 70 inches of snow annually, we can be sure these hunter-gatherers lived difficult lives and faced no greater challenge than the environment itself. Formed into small groups, they lived off the land, only proving their existence to those alive today with their scattered remains. Most likely attracted by water, forest, and an abundance of big game, we cannot be sure if they were present in Elk River, but archaeological records prove their existence. It's important to remember that for most of human history, this is the way people lived, brutally and briefly. How these people came to what would become Minnesota is an ongoing debate. Suffice it to say that they were here, they were smart, and they stayed for all that the land had to give. As time passed, complex cultures and societies formed. Newcomers from the north and east entered the region and mixed with the pre-existing population to form new, documented communities. These Paleo-Indians developed into the first Native American societies. Here in Elk River, and the rest of the state, 
no presence was stronger than that of the Dakota and the Ojibwe. These semi-nomadic inhabitants occupied much of the Great Lakes Territory, Western Dakotas, and parts of Iowa and Wisconsin. They crafted tools and moved with the seasons, residing in villages of bark longhouses or teepees, where they would work gardens, process hunted game, and raise families. They worked the land and would have made their presence felt everywhere they went. Part of the year they would you know, be off on hunting parties and they would even go out into the plains themselves sometimes, you know, even in the prairies of western Minnesota to hunt bison. And they had villages, but a good part of the year they would um, move around in what, family groups, small bands, and then tend to get back together like uh, towards winter and in the winter in certain uh, places. The Dakota people are so deeply rooted in Minnesota's history, they give us its name. It comes from the Dakota phrase, Minnesota Makoche, meaning land where the waters reflect the clouds. Originally, the Ojibwe lived in the northeast of the continent until around 15,000 years ago, when they began migrating west. It is believed this occurred in part due to a prophecy urging them to seek the land where food grows on water, a likely reference to wild rice. Traveling along the water and living in seasonal villages, they came to control much of the north and northeastern edge of Minnesota. As for Elk River, Two battles occurred here in the spring of 1772 and 73 near the confluence of the Elk and Mississippi Rivers at the Holton Conservation Area. A 25-acre plot once farmed by the famous Holton family, it's an example of how Elk River used to be. There had been peaceful relations between the two tribes. Um, there started to become more conflicts between them and the Ojibwe started, you know, expanding their territory and resulted in, in warfare between the Dakota and uh, the Ojibwe. And the Ojibwe eventually drove the Dakota out of their, essentially, their, their homeland in the forests of uh, kind of central, maybe a little bit north central Minnesota. The only account of the battle was produced decades later by William Warren, himself an Ojibwe and member of the Territorial Legislature in 1851. The Ojibwe have since referred to the land as a battleground. Modern archaeologists and historians have, as of yet, not verified his claims. Native oral histories, however, agree. This happened. What follows is William Warren's understanding of these two battles. Spring, 1772. Following years of contest with the invading Dakota, the Ojibwe gathered a force of 120 men and paddled down the Mississippi under the leadership of Big Martin. A scout canoe, strafing the eastern bank of the Mississippi, flanked by runners on the shorelines, came upon a group of Dakota just above the mouth of the Elk River. Upon hearing the news, the main party pulled their canoes onto the grassy eastern shore, applied paint, rushed through the wooded bottom, and prepared for battle. They came upon a roughly equal force of unassuming Dakota warriors. The Ojibwe set upon the Dakota. Time passed, and more and more Ojibwe came upon them from the woods in a line roughly half a mile long. They threw down their blankets, weapons, and other encumbrances and retreated down the prairie towards the mouth of the Elk River. This fighting retreat was kept up for about three miles. Now, the Dakota met a large party of their fellows who had come across from the Minnesota River to aid them in their fight against the Ojibwe's. This left the Ojibwe's greatly outnumbered by more than double. Shocked, the Ojibwe ran up and along the banks of the Elk River and held positions in a grove of oak trees. Here, the fight continued for a long time. The Ojibwe's fired from behind tree cover and the Dakotas dug holes in the ground on the open prairie, gradually approaching their foe. The Dakota, after losing many lives by this tactic, lit the prairie grass 
aided by a strong southern wind and the low spring grass, still covered with the previous year's dry grass, ablaze. Soon the Ojibwe were forced to retreat, leaving the injured to be burned. Running, panting as they went, the Ojibwe ran towards the Mississippi and flung themselves into the waters only to take refuge on an island. The Dakota followed. Upon finding the Ojibwe secure on their island defense, the Dakota fell back, ending the engagement. The Ojibwe acknowledged the loss of eight of their warriors, with three burned by the flames. They claimed having taken many more Dakota lives, especially from the cover of the Oak Grove. To this point, even the Dakotas have acknowledged their superior aim during this phase of the battle. Spring, 1773. The Ojibwe, numbering 60, traveled down the Mississippi again. In the exact same spot of the previous battle's first encounter, they came upon an even greater number of Dakota, around 400 warriors. Again, under the command of Big Martin, they set camp refusing to retreat. Both could see the other's fires during the night. In preparation, the Ojibwe dug holes two or three feet deep, large enough to hold one or two men to shoot from and withstand the next day's expected attack. Early that morning, the Dakota took up positions in a wood within bullet range, overlooking the Ojibwe's defenses and engaged. Fighting ensued for the whole day with few casualties to either side. Only when an enemy was seen to fall that the bravest warriors would rush forward from their cover to secure the scalp. This exchange would be brief, hand-to-hand, -hand, and deadly. It was this type of exchange which killed Big Martin, who was the chief target of Dakota bullets. The Ojibwe, discouraged by the loss of their war chief, made a silent retreat back to their village at Sandy Lake. Since the crossing of Christopher Columbus some 200 years before, by the 17th century, colonies had been established and secured along the entire continental seaboard. Enticed by land, its resources, and profits back home, French and English merchants operating along the waterways of the Great Lakes found justification for their journey in fur. By the 1630s, the Great Lakes region was renowned for its ancient and inexhaustible wilderness. Though we most closely associate beaver with the fur trade, given its use in hats, any and every animal was hunted. Deer, elk, bear, mink, muskrat, rabbit, and fox. To increase efficiency and reduce personal risk, traders cut natives in. European companies would trade manufactured goods such as muskets, glassware, and clothing in exchange for pelts. By mid-century, trade blossomed across all of eastern and central Canada down into the Great Lakes. During this time, trade posts, which would eventually become Grand Portage and Duluth, were established and keep the fur trade's legacy alive. The promise of wealth attracted increasing numbers of Frenchmen who, together with Native Americans, began transforming the upper Mississippi into a cosmopolitan society. The elk in Mississippi rivers carried an untold number of Dakota, Ojibwe, French, and British trappers over the 16th, 17th, and early 18th centuries. Though generally peaceful and mutually beneficial, the fur trade would be overshadowed by events in the East. As colonial administration, population, and formal control established itself along the Atlantic coast, Europeans began expanding their influence further and further west. To facilitate this expansion, expeditions were commissioned in order to chart and document the landscape and to initiate native diplomacy. Thirty years after Pierre Radisson and Medard de Grossier first journeyed to and claimed the Great Lakes for France, in the 1680s, Louis Hennepin, after whom Hennepin County is named, reached St. Anthony Falls, 
literally putting what would be Minnesota on the map. British explorer Jonathan Carver, as in Carver County, went a step further and, by traveling the upper Mississippi, became the first European to verifiably enter present-day Sherburne County. But Elk River was still over a century away. From 1754 to 1763, the Seven Years' War, alternately the French and Indian War, saw French influence wane. In the peace treaty, France ceded or compensated her allies in the case of Spain all continental colonial territory. In the following two decades, a shocking rebel victory in the American War of Independence would facilitate westward expansion new style. No longer would fur influence intercontinental relations, but access to and control over the land itself. Urgency in controlling the new American frontier led to the Northwest Ordinance of 1783. Its boundaries stretching from Ohio west, riding the eastern side of the Mississippi. In a deal with Napoleonic France, third U.S. President Thomas Jefferson purchased the roughly 827,000 square mile Louisiana Territory, more than doubling the size of the United States for $15 million. Soon after, from 1803 to 1805, Zebulon Pike traveled up along the Mississippi to map the new frontier on behalf of the army. It is he who, commenting on the once large elk population, gives the Elk River its name. It is worth noting, though Minnesota was ostensibly American right after the Revolution, the Northwest Ordinance, Louisiana Purchase, and their requisite exploration created two competing visions of the future. One native and one American. Zebulon Pike's expedition not only traveled the Elk River, but initiated U.S. Indian relations in the northern frontier. Among other objectives, Pike was charged with securing the land for a fort along the Mississippi to project power, keep peace, and to secure a military and economic outpost to facilitate further expansion. In the first treaty with Minnesotan natives, Pike acquired land at the confluence of the Mississippi and Minnesota Rivers. Ratified by Congress in 1808, the spiritual home of the Dakota known as Bedote would become known as Fort Snelling. Originally Fort St. Anthony, it secured the fordable headwaters of the Mississippi and effectively gave the United States strategic control over central and southern Minnesota. Stillwater, Mendota, and Taylor's Falls were established while Fort Snelling was being constructed. Trails to the Red River Valley and border with British Canada had been mapped out and well ridden. With the Elk River being some 45 miles north of Fort Snelling, it is no wonder why its permanent settlement began after American security and civilization could ensure settlers' property. In the years after Pike secured St. Anthony's Falls, the Treaty of Traverse de Sioux and a similar land session in 1837 froze boundaries and placed the forests and prairies of Sherburne County under formal U.S. control. Ratified in 1851 while Elk River's population was in the single digits, the American delegation led by the future second governor Alexander Ramsey, after whom Ramsey County is named, exchanged half a million dollars in cash and supplies for most of south-central Minnesota. The Dakotan natives were promised reservations near St. Anthony's Falls and guaranteed their peace. Minnesota, made a territory in 1849, began to take shape and, distinguished by its geography, welcomed its first generation of homesteaders. By the 1850s, Minnesota was the fastest growing place in the U.S., and its population soon dwarfed its some 30,000 native inhabitants. Though bound by treaty to limit settlement around native lands, settlers rushed in to claim good farmland 
which they planned to buy whenever the federal government offered it in a few years. The trails were packed with carts, and the rivers clogged with steamboats traveling their way upstream from St. Paul. People from New England, Germans, Swedes, Finns, and Norwegians arrived in their thousands and started new lives. Soon, talk of statehood began, and a legislature was elected, the Constitution ratified, and on May 11, 1858, Minnesota became the 32nd state in the Union. Elk River has, and always will be, defined by its relationship to the land and the Twin Cities. It owes its history to the natives, European traders, settlers, Fort Snelling, and its geography. It is under this backdrop of early westward expansion, native dealing, and American power projection that Elk River could begin, and indeed did, when David Fairbo erected his trade post in 1846. Himself of native European descent, it is fitting his trade post was erected near the Mississippi, on the trails leading north, further into the frontier. David Fairbo was an entrepreneur. His trading post was thoughtfully placed between the Mississippi River and the Red River Oxcart Trail. The trails, winding from the Canadian border into the Dakotas and across Minnesota's northwest, guided thousands of migrants from the docks near St. Anthony's Falls deep into the frontier. Hundreds of carts carrying families and all they owned were sure to stop at Fairbo's post. It was so profitable Fairbo was bought out two years after opening in 1848 by Henry M. Rice and S.P. Folsom. That same year, Pierre Botineau opened his own trading post near present-day Lake Orno. Their activity and industry would entice others into the region, and over the course of the 1850s, literally create Elk River and Orno. In 1850, Silas Lane opened a farm near Rice and Folsom's trading post. Two new arrivals, Ard Godfrey and John C. Jameson, purchased Lane's farm and replaced it with a mill pond in 1851. The pond would be named after Jameson's hometown of Orno, Maine, and create the village of Orno. It's impossible to understate Orno's importance during these early years. All of the original inhabitants settled around the Elk River, not the city's present downtown. The mill pond was so successful Godfrey and Jameson funded several local projects. First in 1852, when they constructed a schoolhouse, and in 1860, a bridge over to Main Street went in, with a gristmill being constructed nearby the following year. Prior to 1860, there were fewer than 1,000 people in all of Sherburn County, which was formally established in 1856 and named after Moses Sherburn, Associate Justice of Minnesota's Territorial Supreme Court. Upon creation, there were five points of settlement within Sherburn County. Elk River, Big Lake, then called Humboldt, Bailey Station, currently little more than a cemetery in Big Lake Township, Clear Lake Township, and Haven Township, with Elk River being the principal of the five. Springing up throughout the 1840s and 50s, their locations are worth comparing. Elk River is the only city in Sherburn County, excluding Southern St. Cloud, to have direct access to the Mississippi, hence its larger population. In contrast, other settlements relied upon the Oxcart Trail, which some 100 years later would become Highway 10. Indeed, just as in southern Minnesota, access to the Mississippi is what made and sustained Elk River until the railroads supplanted it. So the 1850s came and went. A small but growing population of farmers and millers created and crafted Lake Orno and spread downriver to Elk River proper. The Dakota War and Civil War slowed their pace during the 1860s. While the city's participation in these conflicts is relatively small, it shows that Elk River was not founded in complete isolation, but a growing part of America's frontier. With the country reunified and the West pacified, by 1870, things returned to normal. 
Northerners, Southerners, and Europeans alike made their way to the 32nd state. The best population estimates suggest that from 1860 to 1870, some 3,000 people came to Sherburne County with the bulk stopping or settling in Elk River. Many still traveled by trail or steamboat, but most came by rail. Railroad expansion throughout Sherburne County took place over the late 1860s and all of the 1870s as its five settlements were connected. Villages sprang up along coaling stations and tracks followed the Mississippi and Oxcart trails far into the north. Over the late 19th century, Elk River's milling and lumber industry rapidly grew. Every day, more goods flowed down the Elk River and homes sprang up along its banks and local railway. A church, post office, boarding house, blacksmith, city offices, barns, and families' homes developed the frontier town into a real city. As the Orno and Elk River communities grew, they conjoined, with the former being known as Upper Town and the latter as Lower Town. The, the centering around the mills and that type of industry in the Upper Town mill pond uh, area, sort of indicative of this area, and then the Lower Town has more of a um, more of a more centered around the train depot, and also, I guess, with the travel that used that was more prominent on the train, a little bit more of like retail, a sort of um, customer service sort of thing. You you would there would be restaurants and hotels and and all sorts of things that you could do in the lower town that that maybe weren't as supported in upper town, which was more big industry, whereas it was smaller in lower town. But despite both Upper and Lower Town's success, they were unready to face the challenges of unmitigated and industrialized expansion. Three devastating fires, the first of which occurred in 1887 in Upper Town, destroyed its milling industry. Two years later in 1889, when Orno had been rebuilt, county residents held the first Sherburne County Fair at A.B. Carlson's farm in rural Elk River. Twelve years after Upper Town's fire in 1898, Lower Town would experience its own. Started and spread from S.C. Brown's dry goods store in downtown Elk River, the fire would burn everything between it and the railroad tracks, causing some $50,000 in damages. Reconstruction was completed by the end of that year, with downtown Elk River transformed from a city of wood into a city of brick. Brick Block, as downtown would become known, proved useful in limiting the effects of another fire in 1915. Finally, a water tower was erected in Elk River where it still stands today, in its original color in 1920. At this point, Elk River's frontier days were over. Settlements now stretched across the entire U.S. and most homesteading land was bought up. Everyone who came knew where they were going, and had ample means to get there. Goods continued to flow down the Mississippi, and trains, like steamboats and carts before, were being outmoded by automobiles. Local producers could afford to sell locally rather than export to the south, keeping wealth within the county and increasing local services. Since the 1920s, life took on its contemporary look, and their developments are much more familiar with residents today. Living memory includes the transition into a truly modern Elk River, which began in the 1960s with nuclear power. In 1963, a nuclear power plant was built between Highway 169 and Highway 10, where the refuse-derived power plant is today. Proposed in 1955, accepted in 58, and built until 63, Elk River's power plant was one of the first nuclear plants in the U.S and the first in Minnesota. Installed to augment Elk River's 1916 hydroelectric dam at Lake Orno, its short five-year lifespan was due to cost-effectiveness, not safety hazards. Tens of thousands attended its opening, and residents showed their support through local business and atomic branding. The reactor presages Elk River's status as Energy City, granted in 1997 by the Minnesota Environmental Initiative it was earned for the city's demonstration of efficient and renewable energy products, services, and technologies. We have an Energy City Commission, 
and I think that they are trying to be more active and take advantage of that title, promote things that really show Elk River as Energy City. I remember in years past, we've had demonstration projects that show you know, that we are Energy City. It's kind of in flux right now. But I think it is important to keep that designation. I, I think it has meaning, and I think we just have to uh, take care and time to take more advantage of it. Relics of the frontier still exist today and keep Elk River's heritage alive. The 1920 water tower, Bailey's Point and Holton Nature Preserves, Orno and Vernon Cemetery, Elk High Stadium. The Union Congregational Church. And of course, Oliver Kelly Farm. These sites dot the whole community and have been continuously enjoyed since their creation. Elk River has and will always remain a unique city. Though no longer the gateway to the Minnesotan frontier, its history has shaped and been shaped by everyone who came. Formed by glaciers and rock, forests and prairies, rivers and lakes, people and plans. It took a lot to get Elk River from there to here. <laughs>